Ladies and gents, welcome to UX, and this is History Summarized: The Ottoman Empire by the channel of Oris Akdashi Production. Leave it to the furniture boys to pioneer a comfort-first attitude towards imperialism. Join Blue investigating the history of the Ottoman Empire and find out why the sick man of Europe is more than their nickname applies. I mean, yeah, Ottoman Empire was gigantic. Ottoman Empire is the first uh, empire that actually, uh, you know, scaled the walls of Constantinople, right? Nobody basically, you know, invaded that city before Ottoman Empire. So yeah, Ottoman Empire was big. I mean, uh, lots of you know medieval time uh, TV shows and movies that shows the you know the, the heaviness of Ottoman Empire. Even the you know empire is not involved in the show. That pe the way people talk like how big Ottoman Empire was at certain points is just ridiculous. So yeah, it's gonna be fun. I, I clearly have no idea in I mean in detail. I don't know much about Ottoman Empire, so this is gonna be a fun video for me. I wrote quite a few Ali Sakashi production videos already. If you haven't seen them, check out the cast as a playlist I wrote for it. I upload lots of videos in 24 hours, so you know you might have missed some of them. Check that out. Check out the playlist too, like Internet Historian, CGP Grey, a Real Life Floor, a Tier Zoo. Yeah, let's watch this one. Ah, yes, the Ottoman Empire. A land of proud history, unique furniture, and criminally underappreciated Assassin's Creed sequels. Oh, yeah. Between its rise in the 1300s... I, I don't get it why people hated Revelations. That was just... I, I know it was a bit different from the first Assassin's Creed 2 and the Brotherhood. But Revelation was fine. It was different, but it was fine. And its dissolution after the First World War, the Ottomans have been around for a good long while, and they spanned a lot of the Mediterranean in the interim. Early modern Europeans refer to them as the sick man of Europe as a polite way of saying just die already, but as we'll see, that lasting portrayal of weakness and seemingly perpetual decline really misses the point. So, to find out what makes the Ottomans more than just a sick man, let's do some history. Early Ottoman history is notoriously murky because they didn't do a lot of writing until they stopped moving their capital every 30 years and properly settled down. But it all started with this one guy named Osman, who had a very apocryphal but nonetheless interesting dream of a tree growing out of him and covering the entire world in its shade, which is some pretty hardcore foreshadowing. See, Osman was the Damn. leader of a small Anatolian tribe left in the messy post-Mongol power vacuum, and as far as his descendants are concerned, their empire started with him, which is why we call it Osmanlı, or Ottoman. He and his son Orhan got to conquering and pushed north- I mean, obviously the idea started with him, so obviously that's why, you know, they, they, they attribute to that to him. But yeah, that is some way of saying, right? A tree growing out of me that shadows the entire world. In this way of polite way of saying that, I want to conquer all the world, I guess west to Bursa and then across the Hellespont to Adirne, the latter of which remained the Ottoman capital for nearly a century. Now, when it came to holding on to their land, the aging Byzantine Empire had the grip strength of an arcade claw machine, and no one demonstrated that better than the fourth Ottoman Sultan. Yildirim the Thunderbolt Bayezid earned- I like how, you know, Ottomans basically conquered Byzantine Empire, most of it, but it still hasn't touched, you know, the, the Constantinople right there his awesome nickname Saints by doubling Empire. the empire in a decade. This is your empire, and this is your empire on Yildirim Bayezid. Yeah. And speaking of Sultan Yildirim Bayezid, I should say that my pronunciations have been cleared by my very Turkish college roommate Emre, so I'm doing my best here. But anyway, as you can see, the early- What I'm thinking is uh, Byzantium Empire still survived in the Constantinople, sure, but look at the uh, things around it. It's dominated by Ottoman Empire. So isn't that becomes a more, you know, I guess, living day-to-day -day life more fearful? I mean, just getting outside your wall means you're gonna, you know, go in the territory of basically Ottoman empires. And obviously they want to sack you. So everyday affairs are scary, isn't it? The early Ottoman Empire was perfectly bisected between Anatolia and Rumelia by a once mighty but now tiny and insignificant town called, um, Constantinople. Yeah, so after the combined forces of Europe sacked the city 200 years earlier while on their way to a crusade that they never even started, Constantinople was a shell of its former self. They tried to recruit allies to bail them out, but it didn't really work. Even an Ottoman force at the gates of Constantinople couldn't compel the Europeans to break their reputation for legendarily poor teamwork. Luckily for the Byzantines, this quasi-Mongol guy Tamerlane yoinked Anatolia and threw the Ottomans into a brief kerfuffle of sultanless civil warring. Notably the only big civil war in their whole 600 year long history, which shocks me. And if you think that's absurd, get a load of why it's the only one. So you see, the official practice for avoiding succession crises like this in the future was, um, state-sanctioned 
fratricide? State which section. Which sounds really stupid because it it, it, it is. It is, yeah. But it worked though. So I apparently it's still going on today in those areas. So I mean, yeah, I guess to the state uh, princes and the royal family basically is just a tool to create emperors. Anybody else is expendable, I guess. So kill every other prince who's not a king. I have no choice but to file this under history's greatest ideas that were just dumb enough to work. Yeah. So with that sorted out and the empire reconstituted, the Ottomans directed their attention back to Constantinople, the so-called Red Apple of Christendom. Besides being the one strategically non-Ottoman spec on the map, the conquest of the city carried huge secular and religious prestige. It also provided a strategic center between their split holdings in Anatolia and Rumelia, and it had a built-in source of income from Black Sea trade. Sultan Mehmet II really wanted Constantinople to surrender, but they didn't, so he sacked it with insane siege weaponry and a 10 to 1 army size advantage. Mehmet made conquering the most historically impregnable city in Europe look easy. As congratulations, Venice added the Ottomans to the official Constantinople Conquerors Club, where they mostly just shared history memes back and forth. Thankfully, Damn. although lots of the city was destroyed, the famous I mean, business- Why would uh, Constantinople would say, okay, we give up? I mean, they know what that history is, you know. For years and years, centuries and centuries, nobody could touch them. Even the Ottomans up until that point basically spread east and west but still couldn't touch their city. So I was there like, oh, we're gonna be fine. But imagine the shock and the surprise in that people when the you know, walls actually fell down like that and they actually got in. That would be so ridiculous. The Byzantine Church of Hagia Sophia survived, and the Sultan was so awestruck by it that he ordered its conversion to a mosque to preserve it. As a result, Hagia Sophia, as it's known in Turkish, is still standing today. The Ottomans may have been conquerors, but they were keenly aware of the historical legacies they were inheriting along with the city of Constantinia. And speaking of Istanbul, let's clear up those names. Constantinopoli, before and after the conquest, was known to the Ottomans as Constantinia, which likewise means City of Constantine in Arabic, and its state is that for most of the empire. Unofficially, people called it the city, and Greek phrases about being in or going to the city, translated as Stinboli, turned into what we now know as Istanbul. For convenience, I'll be referring to it as Istanbul from here on out, even though that wasn't really its official name until the 19th. Istanbul just means the city. I mean, it's not a bad name, knowing how big the Constantinople was, and just calling it the city, I guess it's fine. In 20s. With Istanbul Incorporated, Mehmet the Conqueror lived up to his name by pushing out in all directions, even getting the Ottomans a foothold on Crimea in addition to the Aegean and Anatolian holdings. They quickly figured out that the Europeans weren't really as tied to their religious fervor as they claimed and were much more interested in fighting each other. So the Ottomans played enemies against each other and conquered piecewise, unmet by any wall of pan-European defense. And they got themselves a really nice- Yeah, that is something, playing people like that just to take areas, I mean that's smart right there. <laughs> Nice domain out of it. Between their natural resources and control over key trading routes, they had a doubly advantageous position for most of their history. At this point, their biggest rival was the Republic of Venice, who held strategic trading posts across the Mediterranean, like Cyprus and Crete, in part thanks to their See, massive. Look at that, look at them spread it out like that. Crete, Cyprus. Why why didn't Ottoman just took ships and took over those places then? Navy. But at the same time, oh, Venice right. was also the Ottomans' closest trading partners, so when they weren't squabbling over islands, they were making each other fabulously rich. It was a fruitful, if tense, relationship, and it happened in large part because of the Ottoman geography and both parties' willingness to cooperate across religious lines. It's largely due to this partnership that we ever got the Renaissance, as trade brought back classical Greek and Roman works preserved by Muslim scholars, in addition to the piles of cash that funded new artworks in Italy. Mehmet II loved his classics and thought of himself as a New Age Alexander, but truth be told, he wasn't all that far off in terms of lasting historical significance. And I'm talking a lot about the Sultans here because the the Ottoman government was pretty dependent on their head honcho being, you know, an empire. Yeah. Aside from local governments, most administration relied solidly on the Sultan and his small army of viziers and bureaucrats. Speaking of armies, he also had a notoriously badass personal guard called the Janissaries, who were supposed to serve the Sultan at all times, but in the long run they had a suspicious amount of input into who did and did not become the next Sultan. That was a problem the Ottomans so they are Ottoman version of Praetorian guards, apparently. Damn. Whenever somebody's in that position, they become like that. Yeah, they are unbelievable. I remember them from Revelations. Never quite solved. 
Sultan Bayezid II didn't do much in comparison to his old man Mehmet, but then Selim I shows up and boom, he conquers Egypt and Syria in no time flat. You can imagine the collective Ooh, that the Europeans were making in the news of that one. And this was a big deal because with the Egyptian Mamluk Sultanate defeated and the entire Eastern Mediterranean under their belt, no one could go east or west without crossing the Ottomans. But there was another option, south, and this is where their actual biggest trading rival shows up. Portugal. Uh. Situated on the opposite end of the Mediterranean, the Portuguese figured out how to get access to the Indian Ocean by sailing around Africa. Since the Ottomans had control of the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf, they had a similarly advantageous route to key markets. They tried digging a sewer. Portuguese, like, okay, you do all your shit about, you know, taking key points. I will just gonna, you know, go all the way around the world and reach India or something. Suez Canal in the later 1500s, but they didn't have the right technology for it, so, oh well. Also, the back and forth between the Ottomans and Venice was still going on, but it had settled down when the Sultans found much, much bigger fish to fry. The Ottomans also had beef with the Safavid Persians to the east, but that's not the biggest deal in the long run. And speaking of enemies who didn't put up much of a fight, the Pope called for a crusade when the Ottomans took the Holy Land, but come on, this is medieval Europe, of course nothing happened. But then Selim dies and it- <laughs> Pope like, oh hell no, I need a crusade, and then there's sounds of crickets right there. It's Suleiman time, baby! So, uh, let me take a minute to explain my excited, excitedness at this, Damn, because this is honestly hat. pretty exciting. Suleiman the Magnificent, aka the Lawgiver, reigned from 1520 to 1566, and he is the coolest sultan. Call me yeah, I mean, his enemies gave him the name, the Magnificent. I mean, that's something if your enemy calls you magnificent. Take all you want, but I know what I'm about. In addition to codifying secular and religious law to make the justice system fairer and more efficient, he went on 13 campaigns in pretty much every direction. Europe was convinced that Suleiman was using cheat codes because the game looked like it was way too easy for him to win. He also sorted out some trade deals with the Portuguese, which before then had been rather messier and involved a lot more cannons. So he fixed the laws, expanded the empire, solidified a gigantic source of revenue from Indian Ocean, trade and things were looking pretty dang good for most of the yeah i mean portuguese helped basically indian ocean trade at the time you know even in india you know taking spices and things from india at that time if i'm not mistaken so you know securing that deal was kind of important for the economy damn look at the empire though the size of the empire right there it was humongous the reign of Suleiman was without a doubt the golden age of the Ottoman Empire, and it's because of this ridiculous trade money that he was able to go all out on building projects and art. In addition to the strong colors and bold designs of silks, manuscript paintings, and unreasonably gorgeous calligraphy, Suleiman commissioned hundreds of mosques and other buildings across the empire. The most famous examples are from the architect Mimar Sinan, whose work set the tone for centuries of Ottoman architecture. That man really knew his geometry, but yeah. let's get back to the matter at hand. It's after Suleiman's death that the general perception of the Ottoman starts to shift towards that sick man idea. And I hope I can explain in the rest of this video why the truth is more nuanced than that. The big obvious moment that people point to of, oh, hey, look, now they're really in decline, is the Battle of Lepanto, where the combined forces of Venice, Spain, Genoa, and the Pope banded together in literally the only instance of substantive European cooperation in the entire Renaissance. But they succeeded in stopping the Ottomans from pushing any further westward. The battle was a loss for the Ottoman navy, but since the European alliance promptly fell Part the second the battle ended, there was no follow up, and the Ottomans happily kept everything that they Oh yeah, that's something, isn't it? I mean, obviously, when Ottomans become that big, and, you know, the uh, sultans basically take all places like it's nothing, of course, that's gonna worry people. Like, obviously, the Rome could be the next step. Like, Ottomans could decide, screw it, all power towards west. Take out, you know, take Rome and everything. So, yeah, obviously, they banded together to stop Ottomans. They were that big of a threat. But, yeah, I mean, if you can't keep your alliance, I mean, yeah. <laughs> you guys are really out of practice with the crusading thing, aren't you? They had already. Honestly, not a terrible outcome. Although this famous battle signifies a broad end to Ottoman conquest, I think it's short-sighted to say that it signaled the empire's decline. After yeah. Lepanto, they That's still- like the business thing, isn't it? If you are, you know, if your stock prices are not rising, if you're not making more money, I guess you stall and you're in decline or something like that. There is this mentality in, you know, in all the companies and businesses. You have to- you have to make more money every year, otherwise you're in decline, something like that. So this kind of like that. Ottomans stop spreading, that's it. This is the mark, the you know, start of the end, I guess. 
people had their trade networks, they still had their government, they were still producing beautiful art, and they happily held on to lots of their territory without any threat of civil war. They had some rebellions, some client kingdoms came and went here and there, and there was some business with Vienna that didn't go anywhere, but aside- Not civil war because nobody's left. All the princes died, except one who's, a, I guess, the king now. Right from a few fuzzy frontiers, the Mediterranean core of the empire was very stable for another two and a half centuries after the Golden Age. Modern scholars have started filing this period under stagnation, but I feel like even that has a negative connotation. This is weird, isn't it? Look at that, Greece fell, but Crete didn't. I mean, this feels something like, right? The, you know, the, all the uh, Greek civilizations that we know of basically took things from Mycenaean Crete civilization. And all these years later, Greece fell, but Crete is still standing there. I personally prefer to describe the Ottoman Empire as chilling in the 15th, 16th, and 1700s, and I honestly don't think there's anything wrong with that. I kind of feel like I'm on a body image campaign, like stop stigmatizing empires, they come in all shapes and sizes, but they do! And this is a really good example of that! <sighs> anyway. I'll share a couple fun stories from this period, and then I'll hop forward to wrap this all up. So in the early 1600s, Sultan Ahmed- Yeah, but see, like, as the, the chilling thing, the point with that is, uh, if you're chilling, th that goes against the ambitious human nature. If you're not conquering places and not at war, that means you don't have ambitions anymore. If you don't have ambitions and you're just fine with whatever you have, that means you're gonna decline sooner or later. That's the mentality people have. That's why people think, okay, so this is kind of marks the end. Ahmed raided the state treasury to build a new imperial mosque, nicknamed the Blue Mosque for the abundance. Look, look at this shit, look at this, all the buildings, this big mosque, the mountain in the background. This would be an awesome Assassin's Creed, uh, proper big, like, you know, uh, not Revelation wasn't that big, and around that time maps weren't that big, but I'm talking about Odyssey origin type, gigantic map type thing. With, you know, set during the, you know, peak of the Ottoman Empire or something like that, or any time during the Ottoman Empire, with all this Ottoman uh, different type of architectures, mountains and things in the background, you could make an awesome Assassin's Creed out of this, especially with the, you know, latest thing that they're going through. Origins, the, the effort they put into that game was just looking gorgeous, same thing with Odyssey, the time and effort they put into small details here and there, architecture building, the way it looks, the lighting and everything. They could make an awesome Assassin's Creed with this. Abundance of rare Persian aquamarine stone decorating the interior. Legend goes that after the mosque was built, some French traders were very impressed, and when they went home, they told all of their friends about the beautiful turquoise, i.e. Turkish, <laughs> stone. So with time, the word turquoise, or turquoise, simply referred to that bright blue color found inside Ahmet's mosque. And I generally think it's a gorgeous building. How did it become the green thing then? Turquoise is usually greenish tint, right? When I saw it in person, it absolutely blew me away. And on the other on the other side of that, you have Sultan Murat IV, who banned alcohol and coffee, and then would go bar hopping at night in disguise in search of lawbreakers. If he found one, he would surprisingly reveal his true identity and then gleefully behead them. So, you win some, you lose some. Also, uh, some pirate- <laughs> Which is that show, man, who's your boss or something like that, right? Where boss becomes an employee, disguises himself and go, this is that versus that, I guess. Who's breaking the law? Parts of his captured Iceland for a hot minute, which is like 17 different layers of confusing. But again, I'm jumping ahead because the 1700s are mostly just Russia and Austria flexing their muscles and pushing down on the northern Ottoman border, and Persia still poking around the eastern front every once in a while, but internally things were still doing well overall. The problem was that it- Look at this shit! Is that how it looks today? There's a place where you could stand and this uh, mosque looks that high above the ground and that gigantic. And the sun sets like that. Oh, man, I hope somebody makes an assassin grid out of this. This is awesome. The general apathy towards reform kept the Ottomans half a century behind the rest of Europe in terms of technology, scholarship, and military training. So it's the 1800s where their problems come to a head all at once and stuff actually starts going tangibly downhill for the Ottomans. You remember how earlier I was saying that it would have been really easy to stand up to the Ottomans if Europe properly teamed up? Yeah, so this is exactly when that happens, and unsurprisingly, it worked really well. The big threats this time around came from the West, as the Napoleonic Wars were spilling out all 
all across Europe. France rolled through Egypt and Britain followed shortly behind, with the result being that Egypt became semi-independent, turning into a vassal state rather than a fully-fledged Ottoman territory. After that, France, Russia, and England helped Greek revolutionaries gain independence, and then France yoinked Algeria in the confusion. Then, in 1878, another war with Russia saw 50% of the Balkans go poof, England officially swiped Egypt for themselves in 1882, and Italy colonized Libya in 1912, the same year that Serbia, Bulgaria, and Greece swept up the rest of the Balkans. Damn, you, in the end, Europeans basically piece by piece took things for them, I guess. At this point, it's really just a big European game of, hey, let's partition the Ottomans, woo! Yeah. And as you can see, it's really after 1870 that the proverbial sick man started dramatically coughing into that handkerchief. On the one hand, it wasn't all terrible, as there were a handful of economic, military, legal, social, and technological reforms that helped modernize the empire through the 1800s. As a side note, this period saw the refinement of a centuries-old technique of water painting called ebru. In what's really reverse watercolor, artists transferred dyes into a pool using special tools to create shapes out of spots, and ultimately transfer the image onto a piece of paper. The effect it produces gives it the nickname paper marbling, and it is I gorgeous. Love that. The best part is, ebru is still widely practiced today. What? But returning to my earlier- Even transfer to paper like that? This is awesome. Point, pretty pictures usually can't save an empire, and the fact that them sort of keeping pace is news proves the point a little bit, so let's wrap this up. After the Ottomans allied with Germany and the Central Powers in the First World War and promptly lost, the post-war Sykes-Picot agreement between Britain and France carved up the Levantine and Arabian territories, confining the Ottomans to Anatolia under strict supervision of the Allies. The Turks proceeded to fight back against the Allied powers in the Turkish War of Independence, which which ended with Mustafa Kemal Atatürk and the Republican People's Party officially canning the Ottoman Empire and founding the modern Republic of Turkey. I'm having fun with the Turkish words, sue me. And that's the Ottoman Empire. It had a really long run, and I would say a pretty solid one at that. While it's a fascinating yeah. story in general, it's useful because it addresses how we see decline. The Ottomans had a rise, a peak which turned into a long plateau, and then a sharp fall at the very end. It's crucial to our understanding of history that we recognize the possibility of unconventional historical trajectories. Like, for instance, how there can be a middle ground between Golden Age and horrible collapse. The Ottomans are a great example of how an empire with good geography and solid economics can spend over two centuries doing the impossible, sitting back and chilling out. Thank you all so much yeah. for watching, and as the credits roll, we take a moment to... <coughs> Damn, though, you know, Ottoman Empire was humongous, and the way they sacked Constantinople, that's just frightening, like, that was kind of easy. That was, I never thought it would be easy, when I heard, like, you know, Ottoman Empire could first time conquer Constantinople. I'm like, okay, it must have been a you know, really stressful thing and it just happened. No, I think they made it look easy. That's just something. Damn. The art thing. I never saw that before. You know, drawing a oil paint on the water like that and then transferring to paper. That was awesome. Yeah. In the end, basically, you know, European countries pick off Ottoman Empire one by one. And the last time when they pick off, you know, basically created all the Middle East problems that we are even, you know, uh, having issue today. I mean, just, uh, you know... It's, it's already going down there, you know, Israel-Palestine thing right now, so yeah. Alright, that was the Ottoman Empire history summarized. If you like my reaction, don't forget to like and subscribe, check out the reaction, this link in the description, check out the castle, please check out the end cards, and I'll see you next time.